Thank you so much, Arthi. So we have an amazing panel lined up for you today. We have actually assembled four experts in their field representing Python, R, and Julia. So all that matters in data science, because all that non-open source stuff nobody cares about. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to very briefly introduce myself. I'm James Powell. I'll be your moderator today. I have some questions in reserve to ask these panelists, but the purpose of this, of this panel is for you to ask them questions. So the moment you feel like there's something that you have a burning desire to know, raise your hand and we'll run a mic to you and you'll be able to hear the wisdom of our great panelists. <laughs> that said, I'd like to start off by giving our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, to tell you a little bit about their background, their experiences in data science, their experiences in the open source community, and they can also, if they'd like, mention how excited they are to be here today at PyData <laughs> New York. Well, this is an amazing event. Let's give a round of applause for Leah. Yeah. Okay, so Stefan. Hi, uh, I'm Stefan Karpinski. Uh, I'm one of the creators of the Julia programming language, which, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a relatively new language. Um, we started the project about five years ago. It's been out there in the public for the last three years. Uh, it is a, a high-level dynamic language that should feel really, really familiar if you're used to programming in Python or R. Um, but it has performance comparable to C or C++. Um, it also sort of marries a lot of the ideas that have traditionally been in two very different camps of sort of low-level and high-level programming languages into one single language. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my, in my talk at, I think, 2.30 or something. Um, I actually used to work as a data scientist at Etsy, um, did a lot of machine learning, uh, collaborative filtering sorts of things. Uh, m mostly, my, everybody sort of has their, uh, their hammer that they uh, like to look at everything and see nails with. Uh, mine tends to be spectral methods, uh, linear algebra. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually done that much machine learning hands-on myself lately, because I'm busy building tools for other people to do that. Hi, I'm Jared Lander. Uh, I think I'm here because James is trying to get me killed. <laughs> um, so I am an, an R fanatic. Uh, so much to the extent that, you know, I actually have a, an autographed copy of Wes, Wes McKinney's Python book and I have not opened it. Um, but, you know, language stuff aside, I'm actually, you know, my real thing is a data scientist. And uh, that term gets thrown around. But uh, I'm, it's not about the language so much. While I enjoy programming in R and I have fun, it's about the statistics behind it. So my specialties are in you know, educating people in using data science methods or programming methods. It's in developing models to help detect fraud or subversive players in networks or identifying outstanding football players. So um, I believe we're here to talk about machine learning, so I will keep the R stuff to a minimum. Hey, so I'm Andreas Miller. I'm one of the core developers of Scikit-Learn. My background is in machine learning. I'm a machine learning researcher. And uh, now, thanks to NYU, can work on Scikit-Learn full-time. So they support me as a research engineer. And so I see myself pretty much as a tool builder. So I don't do a lot of data science in my day-to-day -day stuff. I mostly work really on Scikit-Learn so that other people can do machine learning easily. Hey, um, my name is Julia Lintern. I'm a data and science instructor at Metis Bootcamp. Um, we are a 12-week bootcamp that uh, takes students from all different backgrounds and teaches them data science in, in 12 weeks. So we cover um, everything you want to know about Python and machine learning and move on to um, more intricate uh, topics such as um, topic modeling and um, sentiment analysis on NLP and all sorts of things. So um, it's a really, really cool experience. My um, background previous to that was uh, I w worked as a quantitative engineer at JetBlue. And um, believe it or not, they weren't quite ready for data science, so I, I, I left. So. <laughs> so I don't see any questions from the audience just yet. So I'll start off with my own question. Panelists. What do you think the most overhyped issue in machine learning is today? And you can say neural networks if you'd like. <laughs> neural networks. <laughs> and why? 
I mean, if you if you read a Hasty Tripciani's book ten years ago, they did not like neural networks. Uh, they really they sort of devote just a few pages to it and uh, shoved it out of the way. And now all of a sudden, so they were really popular back in the 80s and 90s, and they got unpopular, and now they're popular again. For good reason, though. They have made uh, enormous advancements in the capability to process these with new algorithms and new processing, uh, not new, more processing power. But that said, it's not a panacea. It can't do everything. While there, it's awesome, it's not, it's not the one hammer that we use for every single nail we see. It shouldn't be, at least. So I, I think the Stanford people didn't like it because they're statisticians. <laughs> <laughs> so they care about... Like, Biostatisticians. Hmm? Biostatis Biostatisticians. Yeah, but... So neural networks are great for prediction, but not great for analyzing your model, and so you can't understand what's really going on. So statisticians don't like that because they try to make inferences about the process. So for prediction, I think it's they're pretty good. And I don't think they're actually overhyped. Maybe too much money is thrown at them, but they're pretty good, working pretty well. And actually, there's not much new algorithms, so the things, the great big breakthroughs, they use standard backprop from the 80s and LSTM, which was done by Hochreiter in the 90s. So actually, the algorithms are not really the breakthroughs. It's more like there's enough data now and enough computation that stuff works. Okay, cool. Jen? Um, yeah, I would have to say neural nets as well. Um, coming from my perspective, um, we want to be able to work with tools that have a lot of transparency that we can learn from. And it's all about that iterative process when you're designing a model. And not being able to see really what the model is doing as much is, um, is tough. So, uh, you know, when um, you're in that exploratory phase, uh, you learn so much um, from the iterative mo process. And not being able to see that transparency is difficult. Um, so I, I'm going to say something that I'm a little tentative about because I'm not entirely sure whether it's hype or not, but I sort of have these, like I'm not, I'm not entirely positive, and that is Spark. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I don't know because people are very excited about Spark. They're using it for machine learning. Um, I've also seen some disturbing things in their in their source code, like you can't have, you know, your indices for a sparse matrix can't go above, you know, <laughs> 64,000. That seems crazy. Like that's, but uh, but I don't know. So uh, I, I'm sort of throwing that out there as like uh, uh, for people to like refute or support. I don't know. I totally support that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. S Spark. I actually had a talk at PyGosm, I think, telling people not to use Spark for machine learning. So Spark is great for like doing the pre-processing of your data, going from like Jensen stuff to floating point numbers. But then afterwards, I haven't really seen many applications that use Spark that haven't, couldn't have used like scikit-learn or Pandas, or because like the, machine, the data on which you actually want to do machine learning is often fairly small. And the algorithms, like if you distribute the stuff, if you distribute random forests, they get so much slower. And it's crazy. You don't want to do that. I have to say, I'm personally really excited about Spark. Um, I think that it does have some capabilities that we can't find elsewhere. For example, collaborative filtering has some really strong capabilities there. And just uh, that it allows us to circumvent the world of Hadoop makes me really happy. <laughs> uh, do you agree with Andreas about the it sort of being stronger in the pre-processing than in the actual machine learning analysis part? I can't say that I've had enough hands-on with it to see that distinction, um, but I look forward to trying. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sort of with the pre-processing thing too. So once you've processed your data, it's usually about a size you could fit on a large laptop or a server, a single server. So you don't need to go crazy with all, all these distributed algorithms. They're nice, makes life a little easier, but most of the time you're right, pre-process it and then run it on a single machine. Mm. So we have a question from our audience. Hi, I just wanted to ask um, a, a question about null models and the fundamentals of statistics. So a lot of machine learning goes, uh, is, an ex is a great extension of the world of statistics, but a lot of the tutorials, a lot of the content out there doesn't deal with the null, the null hypothesis, the null model, uh, the idea of randomness. So I was just wondering if you guys could address the point of the null uh, either on, in terms of education or in terms of you know like getting people to think in this way or you know tools to look at the null models so we know what we're looking at is actually 
I guess you could say, statistically significant? Uh, the answer is going to depend on what century I'll give the answer in. <laughs> Uh, so even though I'm trained as a statistician more than anything else, I hate the whole idea of null models and hypothesis tests, and I hate when I see people learn them in, in high school and college. Uh, they served a purpose a century ago, even 20 years ago, 15 years ago maybe, they served a purpose when we couldn't do things like cross-validation easily. But nowadays, even the idea of statistical significance, a p-value, was arbitrarily chosen by R.A. Fisher 100 years ago. Where did 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.1 come from? He chose them because he liked them. And I even nowadays, I never even look for p-values, and I don't really look for statistical significance. If it makes sense in the model, it makes sense, regardless if it's significant. Is it 0.49, is it 0.51, uh, 0 0.049, 0 0.051, like, what does that really matter? So I'm happy to see people moving farther and farther away from the whole null model hypothesis test. So what do you do then if you're trying to decide whether an effect exists or not? Well, according to uh, Andy Gelman, it always exists. <laughs> With enough data, it's never going to be exactly zero. So we should stop obsessing over, is the effect zero? And then just see, does it improve predictive performance in the model using cross-validation? So that actually ties into something I've been thinking about recently in this area, which is um, sort of plotting p-values versus uh, effect size. Like, how much, <laughs> how, much, how much effect size can you prove? Um, as opposed to trying to boil it down to a single number. I mean, it's almost entirely going to be effect size when it comes to p-values. Uh, I think it's if, as your data approaches infinity, the probability of rejection approaches one. So if you get enough data, you're always going to see something. Now the question is, how big is that effect, like the effect size? It might be near zero, so it doesn't have any implications in the real world, but if it improves your model, it gives you a better fit. Have anything to say on that? Sure, I'll, I'll add in. Um, I think there's uh, so many different interesting ways to see the um, check the validity of the model. So um, p-value, of course, in uh, traditional statistic uh, um, applications are, is one way. But um, with amazing s tools that we have at our disposal, with Python and etc., um, we can look at um, things in terms of uh, which features um, are powerful by implementing them incrementally using uh, grid search techniques and um, uh, just, you know, example, you know, our decision tree uh, will provide us with so much information on feature importances and such. So we have other ways of validating and um, finding, uh, you know, which, which features are incredibly powerful um, other than just the p-value. So we have options. So we have a question in the audience, but while, while we run the mic out to that question, I'd like to ask one small follow-up. What is the difference between a statistics, data mining, and machine learning? You get paid more depending which one you call yourself. <laughs> uh, so my answer, so usually people ask me this question a lot, and usually my answer is statistic cares about inference while machine learning cares about prediction. So mm, we do, we care about prediction too, so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but then, okay, but the, the part about statistics that cares about inference is basically, I would say it's the same as machine learning. Machine learning just gave it a different name. And yeah, I think it comes from your perspective where you come from. I like guess statistics, they come more from like the mathematical modeling and the stochastic methods, and machine learning comes from let's do it in a computer and let's come up with more, um, uh, I can't think of the word, like a, heur not heuristics the wrong word, but computational reasons to do it. They're coming from different angles to the same result. And modern statisticians will, they're going for pure prediction also, and the old-fashioned statisticians are doing the inference. Yeah, I and mean, it depends a lot on what your goal is, but mm -hmm. the book by uh, Tujibani, Hasey, and Friedman, it's called Elements of Statistical Learning. I would claim it's the best machine learning test book, yes. even though it says it's a statistic book on the cover, so. Exactly. Um, your, your last answer about the uh, null hypothesis and, and hypothesis testing just seemed to be uh, asking you to be open for overfitting in the model. How the heck are you going to pre uh, prevent that? And, you know, basically your claims of uh, significance are just on the data itself, but it's, it's, uh, if you're just overfitting, it's going to cause you uh, problems later on. 
I think a lot of the modern tools are designed to try to avoid overfitting the whole test and train, the cross validation, WAIC. Like WAIC puts a big penalty on too many parameters, uh, a bigger penalty than BIC or any of those. Uh, and cross validation is indeed meant for avoiding overfitting. And same with holding the, the test set out. Anyone? No. I think that, I think that. <laughs> All right. So, so before we get the next question from the audience, uh, one other question is, what's the difference between overfitting in machine learning and consulting in machine learning? <laughs> <laughs> Tip your waitresses. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, like earlier this year, John Kleinberg uh, put out a paper of like impossibility, theory, um, impossibility theorem for clustering which basically says like no clustering algorithm can satisfy these like three ideal properties of like a clustering algorithm to have sort of like it's sort of like arrows and possibility theorem except for clustering and so like one of the things he shows like you can't have a clustering algorithm that um, is scale invariant so like when you change like if you just take your distance function multiply it by a scalar uh, and also that if you is consistent that if you like shrink the distances within a cluster and you expand the clus uh, distance cluster like the algorithm will still produce the same clusters. So like now we know like, okay, there's no perfect clustering algorithm. What would you think would be like good properties you'd want for a clustering algorithm? No one? I mean, that depends on what you want out of your clusters. Like all of the clustering algorithms have different kinds of hypothesis and uh, you can like, make them more abstract and make them like axioms of what you want of your clustering, but in the end, it depends w what are the properties that you want out of the clusters. Like, what is the claim that you want to make about the cluster? And uh, you cannot make all possible claims because there's no, yet. I mean, it's pretty clear that there's no right clustering algorithm. You should say like, what is important in my application and then try to formalize that and f try to like fit that. Okay. <laughs> Um, so one, I, this is, doesn't really exactly answer your question, but one of the things that I've noticed is a sort of bad property of many clustering algorithms is the uh, that they depend a lot on the random initialization, right? Like k-means is a classic example, and you know people use k-means all the time, and you can pretty easily just gen give it some synthetic data, and it'll give you garbage results. Um, and so I think you know. Look, thinking a lot about initialization is an important thing for improving the the the, the end result of of clustering. Um, spectral methods are pretty good there. Um, <laughs> I also think that consensus algorithms are very important there. So you know you kind of you, you you can put this meta machinery on top of a lot of different types of algorithms where you sort of look at it and you're like, oh well, there's no agreement here, so these are probably not good answers. Maybe we need to like iterate some more and figure out something better until we can come to something that everybody agrees is good. Um, so I think more investigation in in those directions is is very much warranted. Well, maybe to add, I mean, definitely consensus is very interesting, but. There's usually no good way to validate if you did a good job. So I would always be very careful in inter interpreting clusters. And it's very, if you have some met metric to see, like you can do A-B testing or whatever to see if you actually it helped whatever you wanted to do. Doing just inference on some clustering algorithms, you have no idea if your inference will be correct. Hi, thanks. You we're talking earlier about p-values and moving on to all the other different options. I'm curious what you found if you're working maybe in a large company with a sponsor that's familiar with regression and just p-values and there's all these other um, things we can tell them about our results, for instance, the feature importance in, in random forests and whatnot. Uh, what you found to be most effective at kind of communicating with people that are more, I guess, old school or whatever, and particularly when they ask questions like, that's great that variable x is important, but like if you change it by 5%, you know, what happens uh, to my uh, result, my prediction? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, your, um, your question's incredibly valid because I think this is very uh, real world um, in the way of uh, um, explaining um, how your algorithm works and what it actually looks like. So um, some, um, fortunately there's a lot of algorithms at our disposal that are very easy to sh explain, especially pictorially. So decision trees allow for this um, really, you know, wonderful illustration of, uh, of how things can be classified um, 
and as, as it's divided in a, in a feature space. And uh, KNN is another that is really easy to explain. And um, so there are those that are, are, are easy to explain. But um, in, in the world where uh, things get a little more uh, ambiguous, um, you know, it or difficult to explain, uh, let's take a support vector machine, for example. Um, I do believe it's really helpful to um, d illustrate it pictorially if, if possible. So um, PCA can come to our rescue and um, your, allows you to like plot this, this, uh, these features in a space. So, so um, you might not be able to uh, explain the exact algorithm from head to tail, but you can show the, uh, the, where that, how that hyperplane exists in space. So that's very cool. Yeah, pictures are great. <laughs> so my experience with explaining PCA has been abysmal. Like okay. I, every time I try to explain like what are these dimensions and I'm like, well, they're, they're like a, a linear combination of other dimensions and people are like, what? So I don't, I've, I've had limited success with that. Uh, Non-negative matrix factorization tends to give you more, exp for additive models, tends to give you better explanatory properties, which is kind of nice, because they're not these like weird negative positive mixes. So also, I think better models, if, you, if you're in an, an additive model setting, you, you want to use non-negative um, components. Um, I've actually very infrequently want, had anyone want anything to do with p-values in a business setting. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one of the few cases where I, I think p-values have come up and been of some importance is uh, in A-B testing and knowing, you know, how long do we have to run this A-B test in order to actually have a significant result. Um, and, th and it's a pretty classic. It's like one of the f cases where you're like, yeah, no, no, p-values are exactly what you want here. Um, and I think the issue there is not actually explaining p-values to people, but setting the problem up so that in advance they know yeah, okay, you can't, you know, if you're looking for conversion rates on a, you know, commerce site, you know, conversion rates are very low, so you need a lot of data to support your, your any, any sort of significance. Uh, so don't expect that you can run this for like an hour and get results. You're going to have to run it for weeks, maybe, you know, maybe a month to figure out that this is actually going to tell you something. Um, so setting that expectation is sort of, I think, the most important part. So uh, maybe maybe this is a little bit more controversial question, but uh, Python versus R versus Julia for machine learning. <laughs> uh, what are the pros, and more importantly, what are the cons? I think I can predict how we're going to vote here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> to supplement that question, you could also answer what do you think is missing in open source machine learning for Python, R, or Julia? What tools, libraries, techniques? Somebody has an opinion. I'm going to channel Wes McKinney. We need an underlying table interface. OK. Um, so uh, everyone here knows of Wes McKinney, I assume, right? Panda's author. Panda's author. So uh, he has been giving a lot of talks lately about wanting a one C library to handle all sorts of table interfaces. And he doesn't mean tabular data, he means like uh, JSON style data. And this way, it works in C underneath, everything acts the same, and I could do it in R, you could do it in Python, you could do it in Julia, and just all have different bindings, the one API for bindings to different languages. And that right there would be nice, having a Everything, I oh, hope that wasn't me. Everyone having a nice, simple interface to use to access the data. I know that's not a machine learning thing yet, but that's crucially important and an answer that won't get anyone's head chopped off here. Just as a follow up to this, there was recently a workshop in um, Berkeley where we got together mostly Python people, but also some R and Julia folks, and we basically all agreed that it's a horrible idea. But, <laughs> Of course, you won't change uh, people to go away from uh, uh, from our people from go away from data frame. You won't get P uh, Python people to go away from NumPy, and uh, Julia we, people pr probably want to like uh, implement their stuff in Julia and not have to rely on some C plus plus. And we so people discussed about this quite a lot, and they couldn't agree on how would you store like a missing value, um, and so it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> you know, while it might not happen, like as a data scientist, I don't care what's underneath the hood in, in R. I just care that I could use R. 
Yeah. Right, and you probably just care that you use Python. So let's say it's not someone like C library, but like you want JSON to be a standard, right? XML is a standard. So I think it's not so much about the programming choice. Like he wants it there to be some sort of standard, and everything just runs fast for everyone. He wants Ibis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the record, when I was we were talking about this, I didn't actually think it was a terrible idea. I just didn't think we were going to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. I thought it was like if I could just like snap my fingers and make this thing happen, I would be like, yeah, that would be great. But I I yeah. I don't. That's uh, dined. Yeah, 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 we talked about that a bit. Um, I I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit to answer this question about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of Julia with respect to these other systems. Um, so I would say that for a lot of problems, I think this is in general. If you are you know using Python or R or you know whatever you're using. MATLAB, God forbid. Um, I'm just kidding. It's just because it's not open source. Um, but, uh, but if you're using a tool and you're happy with it, you should continue to use it. Um, the people who are ready to try something else are either going to do that because they think it's exciting and interesting because it's new, or because they're in a world of pain. Like they have a problem that they are not currently able to solve with their existing tools. So, um, you know, for Julia, one of our pitches is that you know we 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 combine high productivity with high performance. So if you're in this world where, you know, actually you've previously been forced to write everything in C++ because you j you need the performance, but C++ is painful to write, then you might want to consider it because you can get a lot of the ease of use. Um, for machine learning specifically, I think you know. I, I'm not, I'm not going to get into comparing Python versus R, but obviously these are more mature systems. Um, I think that if you can if you can process your data on your local machine and you know Python or R are cutting it, you should probably continue to do that. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting new libraries that are more scalable and have high performance that are coming out of Julia, but you know. I, again, I think it's the people. People know if they're in that in that world where they need to try it. Um, I also think if you're implementing these things, it's a it's a pretty good language. I'm going to talk a little bit later in my talk about how it sort of gives library implementers superpowers. So if you're a person who is implementing new cutting edge machine learning algorithms, it might make your life a lot easier because um, you know again you don't have to write it in C or C plus plus, but you can get that kind of performance. I think a lot of it comes down to the stack that you're working with. If you're at a shop that's already, everything else is already in Python, you should do your machine learning in Python because it just integrates. If you're at a, at a shop where it's not all in Python, it's, you know, you're using a whole mixture of tools, then you use whichever's best for you. For some people that's R, some people that's Python, some people that's Julia. So it really just comes down to how does it integrate with the rest of your ecosystem at that point and what you personally you know, love. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say that. Um, so the boot camp uh, that I work at, Metis, uh, we teach Python. Um, the core of our curriculum is Python. So 11 of the 12 weeks is pure Python. But even av having said that, um, we really encourage our students to learn R as well. So if someone's looking to uh, put themselves in a position uh, that is most advantageous upon uh, looking for a job after graduating the boot camp, um, Learning both is just a stellar move, and learning Julia on top of it is is incredible. So I'm the uh, <laughs> I'm the um, meeting each one uh, of these guys but, um, and saying each has its advantages. But uh, I think um, that's the best the best route if it's possible. But yeah, the good news is these languages are not radically different. So once mm -hmm. you've learned to program in one, you can kind of transfer that knowledge pretty easily. It's like speaking multiple languages, right? Like, you know, once you've learned Italian, French is not that hard. And maybe going back to the pros and cons a little bit, I mean, definitely if your stack is already in one language, it's probably easiest to stay in that language. And so people often ask me, should I go to Python from R or uh, why shouldn't I use R instead? And um, I think for a lot of very specific statistics models, they're, they're in R but not in Python. So if you say like, oh, I need this particular statistical test or this particular method, then it's more likely that it's there in R, but it's more likely trickier to find than the algorithm, for example, in scikit-learn, which is more like one place with a unified interface. And Python often integrates more better with the glue code. Uh, <laughs> like you have, you can do more easily like interface with web stuff and so on. Um, but that being said, like, I really, so for the library um, writers, so I write stuff for scikit-learn. 
I don't. I have to spend time using Valgrind and uh, GDDB and GProf to debug and profile C code a lot. I don't really like that. And it's generated C code, but it's, of course it's generated from Cython. If I could debug and profile like in a nice language, maybe Julia, if there was like given the right toolbox, um, that would be much nicer. So if you have to write a lot of high performance code yourself, I mean, you can use Cython, you can use Numba, as Travis probably would uh, say now. Um, but yeah, it, it would be nice to have everything in one place. It, it is really nice when you, like the, the low level code is still in the same language. It, it makes the development and the debugging experience much nicer. Yeah, maybe Numba will do this, but I don't know. <laughs> Um, this question is mostly for Andreas and Stefan. Uh, what responsibility do you feel in balancing making the APIs for these machine learning models easy, such that data scientists can use them, and making them too easy, such that people who don't really know what they're doing can kind of chuck garbage in and get garbage out? <laughs> um, I feel very little responsibility to prevent people from <laughs> putting garbage into things and getting garbage out, because I don't think it's possible to prevent um, I, I, in terms of API design, I generally favor a layered approach such that there's a very high level, easy to use layer that you can prototype rapidly in and not really think about any of the you know, performance details that's built then in turn built on top of a lower layer that gives you more control, but is you know, slightly more difficult, right? Maybe you need to allocate memory yourself and pass it into a function instead of having it allocate memory and give it back to you. Um, and that, that layering lets you, the idea is that it like, lets you sort of prototype a really easy thing, uh, and then when you find a spot that's not the best performance or like is, is your bottleneck, it's pretty easy to, to just sort of like step down a layer in the API until you get the performance you need. Yeah, so I also don't feel any responsibility to <laughs> like limit people. And so, someone was complaining to me like, you made everything way too easy. Now everybody can use machine learning. And I was like, yes, we won. <laughs> I'd like to take one more question from the audience, and then we'll get closing notes from our panelists. Um, so, so far, um, you basically talked about all these tools, which I actually feel a little bit overwhelmed uh, with all the available data and tools we have. but. Um, so all these things are growing exponentially, but do you think our understanding of data or our ability to transform data to some ins insightful uh, information is also grow growing as fast? Yeah, I just want to know your opinion about it. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, what's wonderful about the accessibility of these packages and all of these languages, um, we have the ability to um, not spend the time creating the algorithm. They're here for us. We can spend time reali uh, realizing their potential with data. So um, essentially, we can implement models within maybe many models within a day, and we can learn about the, the um, pros and cons of this model and that model with this data set and that data set. So there is so much trial and error, but we're able to do this because we have all these amazing tools. Uh, we're so lucky. And uh, a few years ago, many uh, more than five, six years ago, we couldn't say that. So um, yeah, I think it is growing because there is a lot of uh, learning through trial and error, um, but I believe it's growing, yeah. Absolutely, our ability to understand data is just getting better and better all the time. I mean, uh, a few months ago, I got an NFL linebacker to buy into an ensemble model and see the results that it would do. And everything we're doing is just get, the things we can pull off of data, just every day growing with these methods and tools, is so much enhancing our ability to understand it and do more. Yeah, I agree. But I think also we are kind of lacking behind in some aspects. So. I think with regard to the black boxy models, that's a lot of what scikit-learn is doing. We're doing quite well. Um, but with the more introspection, we're still more behind. So in, the, in particular in the open source world, like visualization is still, there's not one good solution yet for doing visualization. Like you're teaching uh, D3 uh, and because like 
maybe that's what people are using. There's Matplotlib, but it's not really specific to uh, data stuff. There's Seaborn, there's Bokeh, and so on. But uh, then also, all of these also mostly um, mean that you need to write your custom uh, visualizations for each job. There's nothing like Tableau. So there's no open source Tableau. That's something that's much more on the exploratory side, which much more helps you to understand what's actually happening before you put it in any black box. And I think there we are lacking behind in the open source community there. But Someone create that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, these are uh, these are sort of I, I think that the the understanding and ability to un to 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 say what data means is always going to trail behind your tools because without the tools you can't do the analysis in the first place and the first thing you get is you're going to be like okay we're going to try some analyses and like uh, you know maybe this explains things and then at some point there's sort of that moment of insight and you really get it uh, and then you know some years later that type of analysis becomes completely standard and something that is extremely well understood. Um, so I think we are making progress, but yeah, it's frustratingly slow. It's fundamentally a philosophical advance, right? And uh, that's always slow. It's always difficult. So I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to give some closing remarks. The title of this panel was The Future of Machine Learning. So I think a question that you can meditate upon is, what are you most excited about in machine learning in the next five to 10 years? There is a bonus question. You can answer, is open source important? No. Why is open source important? No. Why is open source critical? And there is a cash bonus if you mention NumFocus. <laughs> What's the bonus? Let's see what I have on me. 20, 25 cents. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, open source is obviously crucial. Um, so so I, I don't know if people know this here, but since I'm, I'm pandering for this, for this NumFocus thing, obviously. Um, NumFocus, there's a, a number of very important uh, projects that are, you know, part of the NumFocus organization, including, yeah, Julia, SciPy, uh, well, uh, NumPy, um, one of the R projects. We almost got R core, right? But yeah, that didn't, open that is in a different consortium. But uh, it's a really great organization for, for numerical software. Um, all of it open source, of course. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think just in general for for science and the advancement of society and understanding things, it's it's reprehensible to have things locked away behind proprietary software that can't be reproduced without paying money. I mean, this happens to people where they like go to college and they use some you know some MATLAB for example uh, to do all of their numerical analysis work, and then they graduate and they can't run their own code, um, and that that's really terrible. Um, uh, you know, we can't really. We can't, we can't have our society's advancement resting on that as the foundation. So, so James didn't find anything in his wallet. <laughs> so um, so there's, he asked two questions about open source and about what we find most exciting. I mean, open source is absolutely critical because this allows anybody in the world to go and build a model or reproduce your code. You can do this in any country, anywhere, as long as you have a slight internet connection, go explore someone else's code. So A, you get to do the science, and B, if you don't know the science, you get to learn it. So it's pretty amazing open source. Uh, without it, I'm not sure how many people in this room would be doing what we're doing. And as far as what I find most exciting, which I'm not sure you answered that question, just didn't. you didn't. Um, <laughs> I just saw this, uh, this new, I guess, algorithm, or it would be the right way to put it, from Jerry Friedman from Elements of Statistical Learning. Do you see the rule fit algorithm? It didn't get a lot of fanfare. I think it did get some fanfare. Uh, basically, it takes, your, takes all your data, first builds a gradient boosted tree, takes the results of that, plus the continuous variables into a, uh, an elastic net. And according to him, he is the creator. It's come up with some really great results. So I'm actually, I've always been a huge fan of the lasso and the elastic net. And I feel now we're combining a gradient boosted tree with that. And if it gets the results he's claiming at the speed he's claiming, that's just super cool. When did you publish that? He published it maybe a month ago. Oh, yeah, but there's like a two year old paper. It's Microsoft an old paper. Oh. Yeah. The, the, no, so no, there's like, uh, Microsoft did that, published that for doing a click prediction, which means they're not using it anymore. Uh, sure. So, <laughs> but, it, oh, that's actually, yeah. but it, I recommended doing that in my large scale talk at by Gotham. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, that's a pretty good idea. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's, but, so, I mean, it's based on like about a 13 year old paper, okay, but yeah. they just released a software a month ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
Very good. So, but um, so I don't think I have to like talk about how awesome open source is because you're all here already. So um, no, you have to talk about how awesome open source oh, is. <laughs> open source is awesome, and Numfocus helps us all to make more awesome open source. Mm -hmm. Also, they okay. printed beautiful stickers for us. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> some, some for you too. Take your, um, you can take your cut and pass it on. <laughs> okay, so the thing take I'm the, the Canadian about, money. There's what, what, what language is this? C Canada. Uh, can, oh, this is old okay. Canadian. I don't think this is valid anymore. So um, what I'm most excited about is like basically two opposite directions. The one that I talked about having more interactive visualization, having easier way to people to directly see what's happening in a data set, go from a CSV file to insight in like quicker time. I mean, pandas is amazing, but I have to write a lot of pandas code before I actually get the visualization that I need. Um, and the other thing is more black boxy things, like build a prediction model, go from CSV file to a thing that gives me a class prediction without doing anything. There's companies that do it, there, uh, like there's Data Robot, for example, and there's research behind it, like there's Auto SK Learn, which does some crazy stuff to predict which, best, which is the best model to use on which data set. Awesome. I want to talk, talk to more to these people, but I don't have time. But I, th I definitely think that is a very good direction. I mean, these are com two like, opposite ends. I think you ha should have more manual insight, but having something that gives you automatically the best machine learning algorithm, awesome. Yeah, so being in the educational sphere, what I'm most excited about right now is something I ran across recently called machine teaching, which uh, takes the machine learning model and it turns it on its head. So you're, uh, you already have your learning algorithm and your learning algorithm is your student. And um, that's the way that student learns is uh, depend, uh, depending on what algorithm you use uh, is dependent on how the student learns. So um, you have your algorithm and the hyperplane is already known and what you're looking for is the ideal training set to teach this student. So it's really fascinating to, um, to even think about. So um, even though we were uh, dogging on uh, neural nets earlier, I think it's really interesting because these um, the algorithm is based on how the human brain works. And so you have this, like, um, the brain informing the algorithm. But in the case of machine teaching, you have the algorithm informing the brain. So you can imagine, like, this amazing positive feedback loop. And it uh, makes me think uh, we're in a really good place for uh, to be in uh, the tech sphere. So um, that's what's exciting. And um, to add to the positive feedback loop is the open source. So it's, again, um, it mimics that positive feedback loop because we're just continuing to compound our, na our knowledge again and again and again in an exponential, exponential manner. So, yeah. So I'd like if you could join me in thanking all of our excellent panelists and our co-moderators. <laughs>